Hey, it's Joe Farrow, Geek Toolkit. This is my update for August 2021 of how to set up InfluxDB. We'll also talk about chronograph and a little bit about capacitor. Now, if you're not familiar with these terms, this is a simple, uh, basically a chart of showing it what's going on here. InfluxDB is a database and it's time-based. That means that every entry in the database has a time code on it. That's a bit different than most other database systems, but it's very, very useful for what we're charting here. Chronograph is the charting and visualization that is actually referencing InfluxDB that's built in when we do this add-on. And we'll talk a little bit about Capacitor, which is an alerting system. I'm just giving you that breakdown so that you know what the lingo is, so that when we talk about it, you'll know what's what here. So what you're seeing here is actually Chronograph, which is the charting on top of InfluxDB. I'm going to show you how to get this up and running inside of Home Assistant. But first, I want to tell you why this is cool. Now... I have a tutorial that talks about how to set up this weather dashboard here. So I already have a tutorial stating this. The thing about this weather dashboard is these are all the values at this current time right now. Outside of the forecast, which is talking about the future, all of these are basically values of what the temperature is right now outside. Now, if I click on them, I can actually get the history, which is nice, but it'd be cool to have a dashboard showing the history and the trends and being able to analyze that data together. And that's what InfluxDB does. This is super useful for things like power measurements. We can do it for weather. We can do it for computer performance. Anything that we want to chart on a time-based system works really, really well. I'll give you another quick demo. We'll go back to Influx, we'll show you that dashboard just so you have an idea here. This is the past 15 minutes, but we're gonna go back past two days here. And now you can see that uh, this is wind speed. I can go at the highest wind speed. I can get an idea of what was the pollution right now this is the air quality index in this graph and i can see okay you know is the did the wind actually blow it away here well after that windy day it started to go down a little bit uh the wind went down and the pollution went up so now i can make some like kind of inferences you know i would obviously need a lot more data than this a lot more accurate data but i can start making inferences like that from this data and that's really why it's powerful being able to have this line over all three graphs simultaneously, super useful. We can also still do things like uh, one-off things if you wanna make it pretty and just have you know, your lowest temperature in the last two days, your highest and so on. And then over here, if you just wanna have like the actual current reading so that you can see what it looks like, you can do that as well. These are very, very configurable, they're themable. It's a very, very powerful charting system and it is actually built in. When we add Influx, we get this for free. The reason that's important is if you're doing this on a Raspberry Pi, that means you get a charting system without taking the performance hit of installing Grafana on top of it. Now, there are some downsides here. One of them is embedding the charts into Lovelace. You really, it seems like you need Grafana for that, and I'll show how to do that in my next tutorial. If you want to see the Grafana tutorial and you want to see how to do that next, please subscribe. I'll get that video out as soon as I can. For now, let me get you going on InfluxDB here. All right, the first thing we're going to do, we're going to go down to Supervisor. InfluxDB is actually in the add-on store. So if we go in the add-on store and search for Influx, you'll see it right here. There'll be an install button here. You'll hit that. I'm going to assume at this point, if you've been following my tutorials, you know how to install add-ons. But let's talk about the configuration really quickly. So we're going to go over here, Configuration. And notice the SSL, I've turned that off. That defaults to true. If you're actually exposing this externally, you're going to want your certificate chain set up. You're going to want your certs and you're gonna want SSL turned on. I do everything local, so I'm gonna turn this off. If you're just beginning and you don't expose anything externally, make sure you turn this off. That will fix everything for you for getting this up and running. That's really the only configuration you have to do. Once you've done that, you can hit start here. You can go over to your log and make sure that you see uh, basically the word capacitor in ASCII over here and make sure that you don't see any errors. If that all looks good, then you've set up InfluxDB as an add-on. Now remember, the add-ons are actually Docker containers. So when you look at all these add-ons, these are all individual Docker containers that are up and running. That's all we've done is set up the database to run the Docker container at this point. The next thing we need to do is configure that Docker container to have a database to receive data and set up a user. Very, very simple. Two ways to get to this, you can actually say show in sidebar here and click on it, or you can click open web UI. You'll end up in this interface here if everything's up and running. The crown here is the admins page, and what you're gonna to wanna to do is create a database. Now create database is up here in the upper right. You're gonna give it a name. The name you're gonna to wanna to use is Home Assistant. It doesn't necessarily matter what this name is, but you're gonna to have to be consistent between it here and when you put it into your uh, 
your YAML later. So I would put it as Home Assistant to stay with this and also to stay with the documentation. Create that database, make sure everything is good there. Once that's good, we're gonna create a user. Now we're also gonna call that user Home Assistant, just keeping everything very consistent and simple. Now I'm gonna walk you through this create user UI because it's a little bit wonky. Watch what happens here. I've already got the user, but I'm gonna create a new one. Uh, we're gonna call this user Home Assistant uh, Home Assistant 3 and we're gonna give it a password of password now what should happen is I can't select the permissions here so when I click this check mark I've created a user and the permissions default to none that's a problem we have to set that to all so we're gonna hit the drop down and click all now here's the problem if you click away from that it shows all but it's not actually set if I go to database go back to users it's gone okay Watch this, we're gonna click drop down, click all, and then make sure you hit this apply. Now it's hit lit up. You see the little uh, toast icon here. Now it's actually accept accepted and that user's created. That was just a sample to show you how to go through the UI, but we're gonna create a user called Home Assistant. With those two users, we have set up a database and a user to access that database. We've given them permission to it. We need to now tell Home Assistant, hey, every time you have a, a setting, go ahead and inject it in there. Let's talk about how to do that. Supervisor add on store and make sure that you have file editor. If you don't have it already, that will show up over here. If you've got it installed and pin it, file editor is going to give you the ability to edit the YAML right here. And this is the YAML you're going to want to put in. Let me show you where I got this from. Just say, if you're rebuilding this from scratch, you understand how I did this. Going to the documentation in the add on store, we're going to scroll down and here it is right here. Super important and you want to make sure the indentation's right so you might want to copy it and then paste it into your file editor. Now if you haven't edited YAML before there's a couple things to know. One is the indentation is everything and so is the spacing. If one of these is off by one letter or one space here for the indentation you will get an exclamation point in file editor. One of the reasons I love using it, it helps you find out if all of your syntax is immediately correct. I want to mention this right here. This host name is normally the IP address of where you're hosting Influx. So if you're hosting Influx on another machine, you would put the IP address there. Since we did it through an add-on store and it is a Docker container, this is actually the Docker container address. That's what this weird syntax is. Uh, if you did type it, make sure that you do a dash here and not something that is, let's see if I can zoom this in, make sure that is not an underscore in the middle there. And then you can see here we're using our Home Assistant database to tell it what database to go into, our username, and then put your password for that user that you made right there. All right, <clears throat> this is all good, but now we need to reboot. So we're going to go down here. Let's see, we're going to go down to configuration and we're going to go to server controls. Click on check configuration just to make sure that you don't screw anything up. This is your last chance before you do a reboot. Then click restart and through the magic of video editing, all right, we're back and rebooted. Now, once you rebooted now, what's happening is Home Assistant's actually sending its data over to that. You can go ahead and check by going to server control and logs, make sure you don't have any errors here on Influx saying that there's any configuration errors or anything there. If you're good to go there, then we can go to the Influx DB and we can start making our database. Okay, so what we're gonna do here, let's see, this for you will look like, uh, there won't be any queries, so it'll look like this here. What I've done is I've clicked on this explore tab and what we're going to do is we're going to say add a query and I'll show you what this looks like. Your database is right here, homeassistant.autogen. You're going to click on that and then you will get a bunch of measurements. So if we want to do something like the wind speed, I can click on miles per hour because that's what wind speed is measured in. Then I'm going to go to entity IDs and you can see all of the entity IDs that Home Assistant has added that have miles per hour. These get added from Home Assistant when the states and entities change. So if you don't see something, make sure that state and entities actually log some new data. You might actually have to wait a bit of time for something to change so that it gets propagated over to Influx. All right, we're going to click on wind speed here for, uh, this is my, my weather station. If you followed my weather station tutorial, you know I called it Epcot station. There it is for wind speed. And then over here in fields, we need to say what we want to chart. We're going to say value. Look at this right here and make sure that, you know, if you have this past five minutes, you may not have any data here. You might have to run this for a bit. I've had it running for two days, so I can go to past two days here and have quite a bit of info. All right, so now we've got our, our first chart here, but it's not super useful yet. Uh, so let's do some work here. We're doing wind speed. <clears throat> we're gonna click on visualization and the title, we're gonna give it a title, let's say wind speed. 
this is where we actually make this kind of uh, pretty. Now we can do a couple things here. We can click on auto and what it will do is it will actually scale the graph to be the highest value at the top, lowest value at the bottom, and it will adjust these values over here. So let's see, these are F, these should not be Fahrenheit, these should be miles per hour. So I'm gonna edit the Y value suffix. If you put something here, it'll put it in the beginning here. So this is all about making this look pretty and uh, basically usable. All right, so I like, you know, I like the scaling, but I really want the min to be zero here. I wanna say zero miles per hour is low. And I would say 30 miles per hour is kind of windy. Uh, we'll, we'll say 20, there we go. So now I can see that the wind has been going. I can see where it's kind of peaking and so on very easily. But I also know that like, you know, if it gets over 20 and it's up here, then I know I've probably got some problems. I need to pull in some stuff from the back porch. All right. Now, what do we do with this? We've created a chart. Well, we can send it to a dashboard right up here in the upper right. We can say send to dashboard and we can send it to multiple. I'm going to say send to a new dashboard and I'm going to call this cell wind speed and the dashboard is gonna be GT demo, key toolkit demo. And we're gonna say send, and now it created that dashboard for us. How do we get to the dashboards? Well, we're in Explore, we're gonna go down a tab. There's GT demo, and there's my nice beautiful chart here. If I wanna go back to editing, I can click on this little thing here and say configure. And we can do things like we can theme it if we like different colors, whatever we want here. All right, let's talk about a couple other things just to help out with a little bit more advanced stuff so that you have a bit more holistic view of how this works. So if I wanna add another chart here from here, I can go into this right here and click. It takes me right into the query page. And let's do air quality. Air quality has actually been really uh, uh, important lately. I showed you how to get the air quality index in on the last video. So we're going to add in all four of these. We're gonna do a multi-line chart here. This is uh, areas around where I live. And you can see that there are a ton of things here. Now, this is another benefit of this. Real, real quick, if I, if I show you the weather details here, this is what air quality looks like in a Lovelace dashboard, right? I get one value. And if I click, I can see the chart, but then I click down in attributes and here's all those other values. With the database access to this, I get access to these dev values immediately. I'm gonna go click on value here just for the actual AQI. I'm not gonna worry about ozone or any of these other ones, but if I wanted to make a really cool air quality dashboard, I have a ton of data here that's free that I can start working with. All right, so you see that it says no results here. Let's go back for the past two days. And now you see some results. So keep that in mind. If you don't see results, it may not have entered anything in the last 15 minutes. Here we go, I can see the air quality going up and down. We have fires near us, so the air quality has actually been getting uh, pretty bad for us. We're normally down in the 20s, uh, so we're seeing a little bit of haze. All right, now, the thing is, this is one chart, but we I have four cities here, so how do I get all of these to render separately? Well, this group by entity ID, if you click that, now you start getting all of the individual ones, and I can see that, like, this red line here uh, which is Olive Street, Seattle, was really, really bad um, just, you know, a little bit ago. Now, remember, if I go into visualizations, if I want to theme this to be something else, like if I want to do greens and blues, I can really make this look really cool. And then we can always go to uh, the check mark, and here it is right here. Now, because this is time-based and these are relative, you see that it goes back to no results. That's another gotcha. If you look here, it's back at the past 15 minutes. If I go back to the past 12 hours, now my data comes in and this is, these stay in sync. So I can't have this one say past 12 hours and this one say past 15 minutes. It's for the entire dashboard, how long uh, this, this measures out to. But again, it's kind of cool because this is what I was showing you earlier. I can mouse over this and see uh, the data points lined up for me, which is kind of nice. All right, I wanna show you one more thing here because again, you know, learning this a little bit deeper, I wanted to spend more time on this one. We're gonna do one more query and show you how to do a single value because that was actually kind of tricky. Uh, we're gonna do the current weather, uh, current temperature, current temperature. So that is for me in the US, I'm in Fahrenheit, I'm gonna to go to any of the IDs and we will do the current temperature here, but I don't want a chart of the temperature. I want the temperature as it is right now. So we'll click on value. Here's my chart of the temperature, which if I want that, that's cool too. Uh, but I want it right now. So I'm gonna go on visualization 
And there's a couple here that work. I'm going to do single uh, for visualization. And let's see here. Let's see what the actual temperature is right now. So it is 55.6. There we go. So that's a way of rendering a single stat. And I can give this a name here. Uh, let's see, outdoor. <clears throat> and what's cool is if you have to, again, if you have to edit this, like I didn't give this a name, air quality, I can just go right here. This is where you name these. And there we go, there's air quality, wind speed. The other nice thing is it actually snaps the grid really uh, nicely. So if you want something like this, you can see that it gives you a little bit of helpers, which makes it very easy to make very beautiful and very well uh, organized dashboards for you. All right, I'm going to show you one other aspect of this that is right here. This alerting, this is the alerting system for this. And what you can do here is you can actually build an alert. And this is really powerful. Now, you can do this in Home Assistant as well. I just thought that the way they did this was really clean. And I just wanted you to be aware of the alerting options just so you can look through them. Uh, say I want to do a, a rule that says, you know, it's really hot. And uh, we're going to do basically on threshold for the current temperature. So let's say we'll go down here. It's kind of like the query thing, right? So we're going to go for the uh, temperature for Epcot Station. <clears throat> yeah, so the current temperature value. And what it's doing right here is it's showing a uh, sample of, of what that chart looks like. And I can say... Uh, let's see here. We're going to say past 24 hours. I can say if it's greater than uh, 100 degrees. Um, and now what's happening is <clears throat> it's showing where the temperature is right now. And then when I type it in, it actually shows me about where that, that bar is. So I can see relative how close I am to the temperature as it's trended. So, you know, if I do something like 40 degrees, then I'm definitely going to be, it's going to be kicking off this trigger. Uh, 60 degrees it's going to be kicking it off, but 90, okay, it's a bit higher. And then I can say, if it hits 90, I want it to alert me. Now here's where it gets really interesting. The handlers that are built in are amazing. So there's this exact, this will actually execute a script. That's really cool. You can actually write something, a log. You can post HTTP if you have a webhook. You can also send a TCP event. That alone is amazing for automation based on data. And keep in mind, I'm showing weather data, but this could be computer data or all sorts of stuff. Now, Look at these other ones here. There's Slack, there's Teams, there's Big Panda, there's all of these things. There's email, there's all sorts of different systems this thing's already integrated with. And if you click on them, then you know you can configure it right here. So if you click there, then it'll take you to the configuration. It tells you what Slack channel if you're using Slack, uh, SMTP for email. There's just an amazing amount of stuff that you can have uh, this talk to. So I just thought that was really cool. I wanted to show that as well. Okay, so real quick review. InfluxDB is the database that we put the data into. Uh, Capacitor is the alerting system that we did here. And Chronograph is this basically this dashboard visual UI that's rendering the data. That's what we went over in this on how to set it up with Home Assistant. If you have any questions, let me know below. Uh, thank you for watching this. Again, this is an update video, so I went kind of fast on this. Hopefully this is super useful. And uh, get ready for the Grafana one next. I'll talk about how to put Grafana charts in the Lovelace, how to set it up from the ground up. Do it probably very similar to this. So if you have any questions for that video, please put them in the comments in this one. I'll be reading that before I make it. And I'll try to get them all answered for you. I want to thank you for all your support and kind comments. Thanks so much. I'm Joe Farrow with Geek Toolkit. Until next time.